Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this webinar under the Distinguished Speaker Series organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. I'm Norman Chan, Senior Advisor of the Academy. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. Our webinar today will be recorded and uploaded on the Hong Kong Academy of Finance website and YouTube channel afterwards. The webinar is also being live streamed at Bloomberg Terminals now. We will reserve some time towards the end of this webinar for Q&As. Online audience may submit your questions via the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished speaker today is Lord King. Lord King was the governor of the Bank of England in 2003 to 2013. And before that, he had held various positions at the Bank of England, including the deputy governor and chief economist. After his retirement from the Bank of England, he has written two books, The End of Alchemy in 2016 and Radical Uncertainty in 2020, to reflect on the financial crisis and offer his views on many of the problems we are facing today. Without further ado, let's welcome Lord King. Good morning, Mervyn. Thank you, for joining, thank you for joining us today. And by the way, where are you? Well, Norman, it's very good to see you and greetings to all my friends in Hong Kong. We're thinking of you in the difficult challenges which the pandemic poses. Uh, I'm in our country home in, in Kent in southeast England, and uh, the backdrop is my library here. So right through the pandemic, I've had the opportunity to spend time in my library. Well, a very impressive library you have there. I hope the uh, weather's not too unfriendly in London. Or can't. No, it's actually quite good now. It's, uh, it's not as hot as it was last week, uh, and it's a pleasant, summer, pleasant summer's day. Mervyn, let's get going. Uh, I have a set of questions on macroeconomics, monetary policy, and inflation. They are very, very fundamental, very important to us. When inflation was rising in the US to over 5% in the middle of last year, 2021, the US Fed was of the view that it was only transitory because of the COVID pandemic and the supply chain disruptions. Since the war in Ukraine began in February this year, very severe economic and financial sanctions have been imposed on Russia. Now the US and EU are seeing inflation rates rising above 8%, which is the highest level in decades. The Fed and the ECB have been raising interest rates to tackle the rising inflation. I got a couple of questions I want to uh, uh, ask you, and I uh, would love to uh, hear your views on this. Let me take the question uh, one at a time. The first question, to what extent the unusually high inflation in the US and Europe is due to the supply side disruptions? And to what extent is due to the excessively accommodating monetary policies in the major industrial economies? Well, I think the high inflation rates we see now, which are approaching 10% and may even go above that, uh, roughly equally divided between the monetary policy response during COVID and the recent impact on food and energy prices of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I think the most important thing is that central banks made a serious intellectual mistake in their response to the pandemic. And what I mean by that is that when the pandemic hit in the spring of 2020, uh, no one knew really what the nature of the pandemic was going to turn out to be. Governments stepped in <clears throat> and in Europe introduced furlough schemes to maintain employment. And in the United States, schemes were introduced to raise unemployment benefit in order to ensure that people who did become unemployed would be able to survive until they could find jobs again as the economy opened up when we hoped the pandemic would come to an end. The strange thing was that central banks decided to engage in significant monetary expansion in the summer of 2020 and again in 2021. But what the pandemic did was that in the spring of 2020, governments around the world decided to you know, shut down parts of the economy, in essence. We had lockdowns, 
And that reduced the supply side, the supply potential of the economy significantly. But it also, of course, reduced GDP and the demand. So both demand and supply fell together. What we didn't see was any obvious opening up of an output gap in the sense of demand falling below the current potential supply of the economy. And if both demand and supply fall together, the worst thing you can do is to try and boost demand, because then you'll end up in a situation where too much money is chasing too few goods. And that's a very good description of what happened in 2020. There were too few goods because the economy in large parts had been shut down. And there was too much money because central banks decided that they wanted to demonstrate that they were there, they were doing something themselves. And so they engaged in significant amounts of quantitative easing, which boosted the money supply, the broad money supply, the amount of money held by the public, businesses, households, the self-employed. That definition of the money supply, that broad money supply, rose very substantially at a time when there was no e obvious economic justification for it. So central banks used phrases like to support the economy. But governments were supporting the economy through very substantial fiscal transfers from future generations of taxpayers to businesses today to maintain employment. That was sensible. It was a good thing to do. But there was no real argument for doing much more. This was particularly extreme in the United States, where by February 2021, the annual growth rate of broad money was you know, running at 27% a year, which was the fastest growth since the end of the Second World War. Now, you don't have to believe in a purely mechanical link from broad money to inflation to realize that actually you should ask the question, you know, what's going on here? Ironically, governments did ask the question, what's going on here? They looked at the details of the pandemic and responded appropriately. Central banks seemed to fall into the trap of thinking that this was just another business cycle downturn, which required some monetary policy response. And I think that was a mistake. Then, of course, having made the intellectual mistake, uh, they then found that they were experiencing a lot of bad luck because the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which had nothing to do with monetary policy or indeed the pandemic, um, came uh, out of the blue and pushed up food and energy prices. I think it's hard to quantitatively divide the two effects, but my guess is roughly half and half would be a pretty good um, guess of where we are. And that's a massive problem because Central banks had let inflation get out of control before Russia invaded Ukraine, but then the invasion exacerbated the problem. And we are now facing clearly the worst inflation we've seen since the 1970s. And that's a big challenge for the credibility of central banks, because the position they're in now is one in which really they ought to be saying, we made a mistake, we let inflation uh, get out of control. We've got to catch up to where we should be. So I, I think, understandably, probably central banks are wanting to explain what they're doing as a response to changes in the economy. But actually, the biggest challenge for them now is to catch up to where they should have been when inflation started to rise. Well, Mervyn, I think uh, you mentioned this intellectual mistakes made by the major central banks. That brings to me to the next question. Uh, the FOMC is meeting uh, later tonight, and many market analysts are expecting another rate hike of 75 basis points following the June decision to raise the benchmark rates by 75 basis points. These moves are rather aggressive and have not been seen for a long time. Do you agree with the view that this aggressive rate hikes are the only way that the Fed and, by the same token, the ECB can tackle the rising inflation and, more importantly, restore market confidence in the central banks? Yes, I think they probably are, uh, because, you know, with inflation 8%, 9 
moving to 10%. The idea that 25 basis point moves around 1%, moving slowly up to 2% for interest rates is clearly way out of line with where um, you know, policy has to be. There's no way that you can bring underlying inflation which let's suppose underlying inflation is only around four to five percent. There's no way that you can bring that down to two percent with interest rates between one and two percent. So interest rates have to go up. And if that means a slowdown in the economy, then so be it. I, I think the, the challenge for central banks really is that they should have not engaged in the quantitative easing that they did in 20 and 21. What that means now is that they need to raise interest rates by quite a lot. And the sooner they do it, the better, because I think if they do it slowly, the risk is that they will then end up having to continue to raise interest rates while the economy is going into a recession. And that's going to be difficult for them to explain, uh, and it will damage their credibility further. So I think the best thing now would be to admit that they did make mistakes, they've learned from it, and they will now tighten policy quite sharply. So I think for the next two or three months, you know, large changes in interest rates would be desirable. And I don't see the Federal Reserve backing off that now. I think they're committed to doing 75 basis points today. And there's even some speculation in the press that it could be 100 basis points. But who knows? I have no inside information at all. What matters is that they are determined to convince people involved in wage bargaining or price setting that they really will bring inflation back to their target of 2%. And it's no good you know, saying that we will definitely bring inflation back, no question at all, we're committed to it, if you then don't do very much. It's not a credible statement to say we will just bring inflation back. And I think the... It, the, the problem behind all this is that the deep down, the intellectual mistake is not due to individuals in central banks. It's not due even to central banks. It's to economic theories about how to conduct monetary policy. And the standard model that central banks use to make forecasts and use to think about monetary policy is one in which the main driver of inflation is inflation expectations. Well, obviously, inflation expectations are very important. But that begs the question of what drives inflation expectations. And in the models that central banks use, be they theoretical or econometric forecasting models, inflation expectations are driven by the inflation target. Well, this is completely circular. You've got a model in which you set policy to influence inflation, but inflation in the medium term is assumed always to revert to the 2% target. And there's absolutely no reason why that's a good theory of expectations. Once inflation has got out of control, people will then lose confidence in the judgment of central banks, and they may well expect inflation to remain much higher for much longer. And then central banks have a real problem, and their models don't work. They've got to adjust them. That's the, the real essence. And I think, therefore, the most important thing now is genuinely to demonstrate to people that the central bank will do whatever it takes, even if it means a recession, to bring inflation back to the 2% target. This is the analog with the challenge of the 1970s, when the central banks that were the fastest to raise interest rates and the most aggressive to tackle the higher inflation that resulted from the end of the Bretton Woods system and the oil price shocks of the 1970s. The most aggressive central banks were the Bundesbank in Germany and the Swiss National Bank. As a result, they not only reduced inflation earlier and by more than other central banks in the West, like the Fed or the Bank of England, but actually they had smaller recessions because they move quickly. And I think the lesson from all that is that we know from the exper painful experience of the 80s and early 90s, that once you've allowed inflation to rise well above your 
definition of price stability, that it, you have to do an awful lot to squeeze inflation and inflation expectations out of the system. And that is very painful and really tends to go along with a rather prolonged recession. We want to avoid that if we can, but that's why central banks really now need to give up the idea that they can fine tune their way through this problem and instead simply have to say, well, we need to take action to reduce inflation. And that means raising interest rates. Well, uh, Mervyn, uh, I agree with you that uh, central banks, the Fed, will have little choice but to raise interest rates very aggressively. But the market is worrying about a hard landing. So based on what you said, a uh, soft landing is unlikely to happen in any time soon. Well, we don't know. I mean, we could get lucky. Um, I don't think it's the most likely outcome, but we could get lucky, by which I mean, suppose there was some uh, diplomatic or other solution to the invasion of Ukraine by the end of this year. And then suppose that food and energy prices not merely stopped rising, but actually fell back to their pre-invasion levels. That would impart a very large negative shock to in worldwide inflation in 2023. There would then be a rebound upwards again in 2024 as the sharp falls in prices dropped out of the index. But nevertheless, you would, and, and underlying inflation might still be there, but nevertheless, a big boost to central bank credibility would come if the rise in prices that we have seen in food and energy were literally reversed uh, during 2023. That would, I think, require us to get lucky. It would not be the result of monetary policy. It would be a fortunate development. It's not impossible, not impossible, but it, it means we get lucky. A more likely scenario is that we end up having to move towards a period of stagflation in which the inflation remains higher because the increase in inflation we've seen starts to get embedded in inflation expectations. And that leads um, both employees, but also employers, to agree that higher wage rises are justified. And that feeds through to a second round of, of, of inflation. And what's particularly worrying, I think, in the US, in the UK, to some extent in Europe, is that labor markets are extremely tight. So many of the people who were employed before the pandemic have left the labor force. And that's a, an impact on the supply side of the economy that hasn't quickly been reversed. I mean, much, much of the lockdowns when they were ended did lead to a bounce back in economic activity. But there are some people who dropped out of the labor force and this is leading to a very tight labor market, which, of course, is a condition in which you would expect to see wage inflation pick up, and which is exactly what we're seeing now. So I think that the, there are big short-run challenges, and for this to avoid uh, a period of recession or stagflation, I think, would require a lot of good luck. It's not impossible, but it would have to be luck rather than, I think, uh, something which policy can bring about itself. Right. Turning to situation in Europe, given the ongoing war in Ukraine and with inflation pressure mounting and monetary policy tightening, the use of government bonds of some weaker European economies have gone up, reflecting some market doubts on this country's fiscal position. In this regard, our good friend, ECB President Christine Lagarde, recently said the ECB would nip in the bud any fragmentation in borrowing costs between Eurozone countries. Would you worry about a repeat of the European sovereign debt crisis some 10 years ago? Well, I don't think one can put probabilities on it, but it's, it's certainly still possible. I, I think there is no doubt there is enormous political commitment among the governments of the countries in the Euro area to hold it together and to prevent what they call fragmentation. But the problem is that it's all being put on the shoulders of the European Central Bank. 
And the issue here is not a monetary one. The issue is, it's a question that the monetary area doesn't have a fiscal union. This is the old problem. Uh, it was a unique experiment to create a monetary union before there was a political union or a fiscal union that had never been tried before. And it hasn't proved terribly successful in the sense that there is still an incomplete design of that monetary union. There is no fiscal union. What's happened is that a se sequence of ad hoc or you know, one-off measures to make fiscal transfers from north to south has been introduced by the governments who are determined to see this continue. But at the same time, they keep telling that their electors, their voters, is that actually there is no fiscal union and that in Germany voters are being told that they won't have to subsidize the borrowing and budget deficits of countries in the south and countries in the south are being told that they won't have to accept conditionality from governments in the north which they haven't elected. There is no democratic support in Europe for moving to a clear fiscal union and I think the great danger down the road is that if the officials and the policy elite in the monetary union keep trying to introduce a fiscal union by stealth, by doing it without being honest with the voters, and in particular by pretending that it's monetary policy, then uh, there will at some point, and there'll be growing reactions against the governments around Europe for not being honest and open with them. And I think this is something which you know, is, is a really potentially serious problem down the road. I don't think governments are going to acquiesce in the breakup of the monetary union. But the question is, at some point, are they going to have to confront the fact that they need a fiscal union? And that is something that would require a complete revision of the European Treaty. Uh, and there's no sign that governments are willing to say to their electorates that we are going to have a fiscal union. I think the, the, the damage to the credibility of the European Central Bank will come from the fact that when it talks about fragmentation, it keeps describing fiscal transfers from north to south as to deal with unwarranted movements in bond yields. But how on earth can they judge what is warranted or unwarranted? Italy has a ratio of debt to national income in excess of 150%. They've just lost their Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, who negotiated the conditions for a large payment from the European Union to Italy. In those circumstances, the most natural thing in the world would be for bond yield spreads between Italy and Germany to rise. No one in, who's honest about it could really describe that as unwarranted. So how far would it have to go? Uh, I think the, the trouble is that the ECB has been, through no fault of its own, it's been put in a position where it's having to act as a quasi-fiscal authority without any democratic mandate from around Europe. Now, I don't think there's any immediate threat to it, but I think that, that tension between responsibilities being thrust on the ECB without there being a clear democratic mandate from the electorates around Europe for that is something which could give rise to serious problems down the road. Irvin, you have previously talked about the problem of diminishing returns of quantitative easing, which, in your view, only serves to bring forward future spending to the present, and which is the reason for the slow recovery in the Western economies in recent years. And if I remember it correctly, the Bank of England also launched a QE policy while you were the governor. So would you share with us your views on the circumstances under which QE would be an appropriate policy response and when would be a good time to exit from QE? So I see QE as really just one way of implementing conventional monetary policy. Monetary policy can be described in terms of interest rates but it's also about the movements in the level of broad money in the economy. And monetary policy 
by its nature is counter cyclical. So when you get a situation in which, for some reason, demand is particularly weak, perhaps companies lose confidence, they stop investing or consumers lose confidence, they stop spending, then demand falls below the level of potential supply. And then you want to cut interest rates, boost the money supply to encourage people to spend today rather than in the future. And if that then brings spending back up to the level of potential supply, then you can withdraw the stimulus and the economy carries on as it was before. So it's a counter cyclical instrument. What it isn't is a structural policy issue or a permanent policy issue to boost demand. Now, back in 2009, after the recapitalization of the banking system and the end of the financial crisis, uh, certainly in the UK, but also in, in most other industrialized uh, economies, what had happened was that the banking system, having had excessive leverage itself, was having to restore its own financial balance sheet. And so it was contracting the amount of lending that the banking system was making. And that in turn led to a contraction on the deposit side. And since bank deposits account for, you know, between 90 and 95% of money, then there was going to be a sharp fall in the money supply. This was beginning to look a bit like the Great Depression in the 1930s. So what we did at the Bank of England was to print money in order to boost the broad money supply. And what we did was to manage to stop it from declining sharply. It never grew more than somewhere between 0 and 5% during that period. So we certainly weren't trying to, and we certainly weren't taking actions that were leading to a rapid growth of the money supply. We were simply stopping it from falling. Now, as we moved on, uh, after the financial crisis, as time went on, then it became clear that the use of monetary policy was no longer relevant because you know, we brought spending forward from the future. There's a limit to how much you can do that. People don't want to mortgage their entire future in order to sustain current consumption. There were, I think, genuine impediments to the growth of spending and demand right across the world economy. To that extent, I subscribe to the secular stagnation thesis. But I think it came from the world economy moving into a sort of disequilibrium in which in none of our economies will we encouraging further spending and investment in areas where there were profitable opportunities. We were pushing demand right back into the old areas of expansion, whether it be exports in Germany or exports and infrastructure in China, or consumer spending and residential property in the US and the UK. These, these were holding back the growth of demand. But the big mistake that was made in 2020 and 21 was to expand the money supply through QE without asking whether it was really necessary. There was no proper analysis of that fact. And as I said, since demand and supply both fell sharply, but fell broadly in line with each other, it was very hard to come up with a good argument as to why monetary expansion was needed in 20 and 21. So I see QE as you know, a, a normal monetary policy instrument that can be used. Um, it influences directly the amount of money in the economy. But you have to ask the question, does the economy need to have the money supply boosted or contracted? And in 20 and 21, they went far too far in one direction. And in 2009, we stepped in to print money in order to stop the money being created by the banking system from falling. So it, it all depends on circumstances and monetary policy should be seen really as a counter cyclical instrument. And if the problem you faced is not a cycle, not a very short lived problem, then monetary policy is not the right answer. Yeah. Let me follow up with that question. You, you, you are of the view that uh, printing money or expanding balance sheet of central banks to uh, deal with a pandemic situation is not a good idea. But quite apart from the argument that QE or printing money is the only game in town, what other policy responses would 
you recommend that the governments or major central banks should pursue to counter the economic disruptions brought about by the COVID pandemic? So I think the, the measures that governments took were very effective. So in Europe, the furlough scheme, by which the government essentially borrowed against the future, it transferred money from future taxpayers to hand to businesses today to enable businesses to keep employing people even though they weren't permitted to go to work. And that kept the relationship between employer and employee together. Uh, it wasn't separated. The, the, some of the problems we see now at the end of the, towards the end of the pandemic, are the result of employers having fired employees. This is a classic response of the airlines. The airlines didn't keep their staff at work. They got rid of them. Now they can't get them back. And so the airlines and the airports in the West are struggling because they can't find the staff. They, they lost the relationship with their own employees. So I think the, the biggest policy challenge for governments today is to try and find a way to get the missing workers back into the labor force. That would ease wage pressures and it would also boost output. That would be a win-win in terms of what we're worried about today. And I don't have any magic solution to how to do that, but I do think governments need to look at their own labor markets and find a way to get people back into the labor force who dropped out during the, the pandemic. I think looking to the longer term, I mean, during a pandemic, I think the furlough schemes were exactly the right response and they worked. I think in the longer term, we need to recognize that for a whole series of reasons, partly the pandemic, which has led to a permanent change in the pattern of spending and output, partly to the realization that resilience is a very important feature of any economy, any organization. That was the thing that was lost before the financial crisis. During the financial crisis, we learned that resilience of the banking system was important, but uh, we didn't extend that lesson to the rest of the economy. Now we know that resilience of the health system is very important. Resilience will change the way people think about the, how they organize their businesses. The just-in-time supply chain won't seem quite as attractive as before. And then also the fact that over really 20 years, we've allowed you know, quite serious imbalances inside our own economies to grow up. So in, in China, the saving rate was extraordinarily high. And it would have been possible to boost consumption in China without sacrificing future consumption. I think in the US and the UK, the opposite was true. We simply weren't saving enough. These differences in saving rates showed up in current account imbalances. You no longer see that significantly in China, but you certainly see it in the Euro area. So I do think that, that there is a, a need internationally for countries to come together and recognize that although the policy changes needed differ from one country to another, nevertheless, we all have to make changes and we need to try and do it on some sort of coordinated timetable. That, those are the things. But the answer, you know, QE is not the answer to every single problem. And the failure to think about QE in terms of its impact on the money supply and how that would work, uh, and, and the belief that we have no idea what QE does in theory, but it seems to do something in practice, I think it, that sort of mindset has made central banks think that any problem could be solved by monetary policy. That's clearly not true. Um, and therefore, governments have got to go back and think about a whole series of structural policy changes, which will vary from one country to another. But that's the only way, I think, in which we're going to get back to a world where productivity can grow as fast as it did before the financial crisis. And I think that's certainly possible. Uh, and in which we can uh, go back and keep the world of free trade that we've got, but at the same time, think carefully about the resilience of each national economy. Mervyn, in your book, 
the end of alchemy, you analyze the system of money and banking in the modern world and observe that the size, leverage, and complexity of banks' balance sheets have grown in recent decades, which have become the root cause of banking crisis in recent decades. You have therefore suggested in your book that banks' leverage ratios should be limited to a minimum ratio of equity to total assets of 10%. This suggestion, if adopted, would likely restrain the bank's ability to lend money. But should one be worried that it would stifle the real economy by not having sufficient supply of credit to support economic activities? Well, certainly the numbers that one chooses for policy on capital requirements or liquidity and the timetable over which you introduce them are very important in influencing the supply of credit, and you don't want to go too far too fast. That's why during the financial crisis, when it became very apparent that the, you know, the, banks, the banking system in the industrialized world was simply undercapitalized, and there just was not enough equity in the system to give confidence to the private sector to be willing to lend to the banking sector because they thought they couldn't absorb any future losses that might arise. We had to improve the, um, reduce the leverage of the banking system. But the way we did that was not to uh, tell them that they had to meet a new ratio. It was to tell the banks they had to issue new equity. Uh, and that did not give any incentive then to reduce the supply of credit. They had to re increase the amount of equity. The, I think the more important factor, looking back on it now, is that we need completely to change the approach to liquidity regulation and the access to central bank liquidity of the commercial banks. What I proposed, and I proposed it in the book, The End of Alchemy, was a, a scheme I called it a pawnbroker for all seasons. But essentially, it was a scheme in which commercial banks would have to pre-position collateral with the central bank, such that uh, in terms of their very short-term liabilities, they would always know that they could be guaranteed a loan from the central bank immediately whenever they started to run short of cash. If that system were in place, there would be no bank runs at all, because everyone would know that the central bank had made a commitment to each commercial bank that it regulated, that it would have access to enough cash from the central bank on demand in order to meet runs on its short-term liabilities. And that's a commitment the central bank would make. It wouldn't have to explain in public the details of that. It's just that the, everyone would know that that's the position that each bank had, had to have a guarantee from the central bank of enough access to cash, and that would require commercial banks to run their balance sheets in such a way that they could pre-position collateral, uh, such that after the haircuts the central bank would impose, they would be eligible for uh, access to cash on demand. That would, I think, eliminate the need for a vast range of capital regulation, prudential regulation, both on capital requirements and on liquidity requirements. And it would mean that there'll be no need for any bank runs at all. I think that's what we should move towards. I think the interesting thing is that given the amount of QE that's been created over the last 10 years, that most well-run banks in the West already meet that challenge. Um, and they have you know, much larger liquid assets in the form of claims on the central bank than they ever did before the financial crisis. And I think that the equity ratios of the, certainly the best American banks, are very close to the levels that I suggested. So I don't think we're, in terms of those banks, very far away. I think for many European banks, they are somewhere away. Uh, and I think we should worry, as John Vickers has argued, that where you see the price to book ratios of commercial banks well below one, that is a market signal to regulators that you ought to be concerned about the value of the assets on the bank's balance sheet. So we can get to this. And I think that a system like this, 
would not only eliminate the sort of crisis that we saw, but yes, it would impose what's in effect a tax on the credit creation process in normal times. But we've been through periods of boom and bust. And if we can impose a small tax in good times that reduces the scale of excessive credit creation in return for ensuring that the banking system does not go bust and have to turn to authorities as it did in September, October 2008, that would be a big step forward. Irvin, in your second book, Radical Uncertainty, you talk about the concept of unknown unknowns. Could you share with us the key points of this concept, especially on how it may affect decision-making in monetary policy and financial supervision? Well, I think the pandemic's quite a good example of what John Kay and I call radical uncertainty. Radical uncertainty is where you don't know enough about what might happen to attach a probability to it. It's much, much broader than the uh, idea of black swans. I mean, a black swan is the extreme end of this, where you can't even imagine something occurring. But take the position in the middle of 2019. At that point, John Kay and I were finishing our book, and we wrote a sentence in our book saying, we must expect to be hit by an epidemic of an infectious disease due to a virus that does not yet exist. Now, some people said, gosh, you really forecast a pandemic. No, we didn't, and we couldn't have done that. There was no way in 2019 that we could have said, you know, we think the probability of a virus coming out of Wuhan in China in December 2019 is 17% or 42% or any other number. That would be a meaningless statement. But in 2019, we knew that pandemics existed. They were not black swans. We knew something, but we didn't know enough. And I think the real challenge is how to make decisions when confronted with uncertainty that you can describe qualitatively, but not quantitatively. And most economic models of decision making under uncertainty assume that everyone attaches probabilities to every conceivable event, and we all know what could happen in the future. This is clearly completely false. So I think radical uncertainty is of fundamental importance. It, it illustrates why economic forecasts are usually wrong and, and rather pointless. It does make sense to talk in terms of risks, and risks which are either likely or not likely, but it doesn't make sense to try and pretend that you can easily quantify them. The economic forecasting profession has a habit on the beginning of January each year of making a forecast of GDP growth and inflation, for example, over the next year. Well, January 2020, no one incorporated uh, a global pandemic into their forecasts and the forecasts had to be torn up within a couple of months. January 2021, no one really knew how many new variants of the uh, virus would come along or how easy it would be to open up the economy. Again, the forecasts were all over the place, most of them wrong. January 2022, no one incorporated a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Again, the forecasts were wrong. Now, that's not a criticism of models. It's not a criticism of thinking about the risks that could happen. But it is a criticism of people saying, I forecast that GDP will grow by, for example, you know, 3.8% next year, or inflation will be 2.1%. Things always happen to prove those things wrong. The real test is to ask yourself, you know, what do you think is the biggest risk that could derail what you expect to be the likely path of your company or the economy or whatever institution you're looking at. And if you can identify the things that could go badly wrong, that really would make a big difference, then you can take action to minimize the effects of that. So managing risk is fundamentally important. 
But the whole point of the concept of radical uncertainty is to distinguish that idea of risk, which is something that is bad and you want to manage and control and try and mitigate, from uncertainty, much of which is very good. So all the exciting things in life, all the new products, all the new techniques, the new ideas, the new people we meet, the new experiences we have, the new opportunities we have, all of these things come from radical uncertainty. And so uncertainty, serendipity, if you like, uncertainty is a very good thing. It's the source of innovation in our economies. Uh, and we should embrace that kind of uncertainty. But that's quite different from risk, which can derail where we hope we're going, where we do need to manage and mitigate those risks. And I think this distinction between risk and uncertainty which has been eliminated from economics ever since really the Second World War is most unfortunate. And, and it leads to a, an approach that believes that you can quantify everything that uh, hold, that could happen in the future and that you can describe how people respond to that uncertainty in terms of, say, expected utility maximization. Whereas the truth is, that none of us, whether it's individuals or companies, can maximize anything because we never have the information that would be required to maximize whatever it is we might like to. We will never have that information by always making decisions, groping around in the darkness of uncertainty, where there are pieces of light from time to time. We know something, but never enough to treat it as a purely statistical problem. Mervyn, you, we know that you are a big fan of football because your passion for football is evident in your writings. It is very interesting that you have actually seen a link between football and monetary policy in your Maradona theory of interest rates. For those who are not too familiar with football, Diego Maradona was one of the superstars in the world's football history. Could you share with us what this theory is all about? So it's really about setting of interest rates, but you wouldn't guess it from the title. So Mar Argentina and their greatest ever player, Maradona, um, were playing England in a World Cup qualifying match, when not qualif in the World Cup itself. And Maradona scored the winning goal by running from inside his own half to score. He beat five English players who were basically ended up lying on the ground. He beat them all. But there was a camera in one of those balloons above the ground that showed you the path that Maradona ran towards the English goal when he scored. <clears throat> and the fascinating thing is he ran in a straight line. How on earth can you beat five people when you run in a straight line? Well, the answer is they didn't expect him to run in a straight line. They thought he was going to go one way or then the other. And so the English players tried to anticipate where he would go, and he fooled them by just going straight on. Now, the point about that in monetary policy is that if central banks have a stable reaction function, that is, if their behavior is predictable, then markets will anticipate that if the economy starts to grow rather quickly, they will expect the central bank to raise interest rates, and they will push up market rates in anticipation. And that will help to cool the economy so that central banks won't have to move very far. And when the economy slows a lot, people will expect interest rates to go down. And again, market rates will adjust quickly. Central banks won't have to move very far. So central banks maybe better carry on for some period without changing rates very far because they have a predictable reaction function. Now, of course, if circumstances which either push the economy to grow too quickly or too slowly keep continuing in one side only, then central banks will have to react and react quite strongly. And that's obviously where we are now. But in normal circumstances, you sometimes get you know, periods when 
grows a bit quickly, then slows down. If central banks have a clear reaction function, then they don't need to take as much, uh, to make as many changes in interest rates as otherwise would be the case. And the reason I think that's very important now is that we've been through a very unfortunate decade, in my view, where central banks believe that forward guidance about where interest rates will go was the key to monetary policy. And that's a terrible mistake because forward guidance stops people thinking for themselves about where the economy is going, and they simply believe that the interest rates will move wherever the central bank says they will go. That's not what you want markets to do. And of course, central banks, because they don't know where the economy is going any more than anyone else, the idea that you can predict where interest rates will go three years from now, the idea of the dot plots in the Federal Reserve, all of this has been shown to be really rather foolish now. And I suspect forward guidance is now dead. But the key thing about the Maradona theory of interest rates is that it brings home the fact that if markets expect central banks to respond to changing conditions in the economy in a predictable and stable way, then central banks have a bit more time to make the changes that they might otherwise have to make. And that makes policy easier. Thank you, Mervyn. Now, we have, we have to move to the Q&A session now. We have around nine minutes left. So I would actually would want to get some question from the uh, audience on site and also from those online. I would like to remind all online audience that you could raise questions by submitting your questions via the Q&A box on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, participants here may simply raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Uh, before asking the question, please first let us know your name and where you are from. Lawrence, please go ahead. Thanks, Norman. Hi, uh, Lord King. Uh, this is Lawrence Lam from uh, Prudential Hong Kong. Uh, first of all, thanks for your speaking to us today, especially sharing your view about uh, soccer and uh, football and, uh, and the monetary policy. I have a question about the wealth gap and the monetary policy. So I think we have been in a very prolonged period of the ultra-low uh, interest rate, as well as the high liquidity, which drive up a lot of the asset price in the like, past few years on the property, on the asset. In some sense, right, indirectly, like drive to the widening gap on wealth between people who have the asset and we don't have the asset. So now the inflation is going up, right? So what, what the central bank can do to address this problem? Well, I think the period, extended period of very low interest rates was bound to push up asset prices. That is part of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. But it led, as you said, to greater wealth inequality as the price of assets went up and those with lots of assets saw their wealth rise sharply and those with very few assets did not see any much increase at all. That's going into reverse. And my guess is that uh, if interest rates go back to anything like the level they were um, you know, before the financial crisis, we got back to interest rates moving between say, you know, 3% and 6% over the course of a normal business cycle, then you would see asset prices fall relative to incomes quite sharply, uh, and that would reduce the level of wealth inequality, and we'd get back to roughly where we were before the financial crisis. And I think one of the important things that central banks need to do now is to have a very clear narrative explaining to people why the current situation is so difficult, what needs to be done about it, and why they will not stand in the way of falls in asset prices relative to incomes, which has to be the logical consequence of higher interest rates across the yield curve. Okay. Uh, Trey Lee. Hi, uh, my name is Li Cui. Uh, I work for uh, China Constru uh, Construction Bank International. Um, I have a question just uh, following on what you just said. Uh, suppose the in, uh, interest rate uh, does move back to where they, uh, it was uh, before the global financial crisis. Uh, 
now the global public debt, especially in the developed markets, are much higher. Uh, how do you expect the policymakers to navigate that balance uh, to achieve disinflation on one hand, but also manage uh, public debt uh, pressure on the other hand, uh, when, inflation, uh, when interest rate uh, increases? Thank you. Well, that's, that, that's a very good question, and I think policymakers will have enormous difficulty in coping with this. I think that we, partly because of this extended period of very low interest rates, we have managed to build up problems on the debt side, both in the public side, sovereign debt, and also in private, the private sector, particularly corporate debt, where we have many zombie companies now. So I think the next five to 10 years will see a significant degree of debt restructuring of many private companies, the zombie companies that will have now to admit that they can't serve, continue either to service their debt or to repay the principal of the debt. And also in terms of sovereign debt, where the IMF you know, estimate that something around 80 low-income economies will need their debts restructured. And of course, interestingly, that's a major issue for China because much of the lending to uh, these low-income economies in the past decade has come from Chinese state banks. Now, I don't think we have the mechanisms in place for restructuring sovereign debts on that scale. We have experience of restructuring sovereign debts for a small number of countries or maybe one large emerging economy but not several emerging economies and not anywhere up to 80 low-income economies. And equally in the private sector, we have very little experience of trying to restructure the, the debts of so many private companies all at the same time. So I think it's going to be a major challenge for policymakers. And I think it's one that's going to be very difficult to avoid as we go back to what ought to be a much healthier world economy without the zombie, of com zombie companies and with interest rates going back to more normal levels. Other things being equal, that will be a sign that we're getting back to a world where I think productivity growth can resume. But the downside is that the adjustment to it in terms of the debt restructuring will be significant and potentially not only difficult to manage, but actually painful. Thank you. Uh, Jiang Guorong. Uh, thank you, Norman. Uh, I actually have a question much closer to the home. Uh, Sorry, can you explain where you've come, come uh, from? Uh, Guorong Jiang. I'm a managing director from Citigroup. Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, with the rising, interest, uh, rising inflation and also higher interest rate, uh, what would be the uh, effect on the economy in Hong Kong, given we have a currency board arrangement uh, here? And also, uh, given the changes, uh, the, well, significant change in the world economy as well as the geopolitical situation, whether the uh, currency board arrangement will remain uh, appropriate exchange rate uh, or monetary policy framework for Hong Kong, and are there alternatives that we should be consider uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the one thing that everyone who's looked at exchange rate regimes uh, says is that every kind of regime is is bad apart from all the others and <laughs> the i can't count the number of occasions on which people have said well can the hong kong link and uh, exchange rate regime continue and it always has and i think that's one of the great components of economic stability in hong kong and it would be very unfortunate i think if there were either political moves or others to try and change that uh, there's no reason why that should change. The Hong Kong economy has got used to that, adjusted to it over many years. It works. And if it works, don't, don't change it. So you know, I'm not an expert on the, the Hong Kong economy. And there are many challenges and problems that you face at present, um, which are you know, more serious than ones you've faced for many years. But nevertheless, I think the exchange rate a link is one that I will be pretty loath to give up without having very good reasons to do so. The main thing now is to try and find a way of living with COVID. 
what, what's happened in the West is that with vaccines, we have just accepted that it, any kind of international travel uh, means that you really have to learn to live with COVID and with vaccines and better treatment. Even though cases are rising again now in the UK and in the United States, people just accept that because the death rate has not risen. And we are going to be treating COVID-19 rather like flu with an annual vaccination, living with it for years to come, I suspect. Mervyn, I think we are running out of time. Uh, on behalf of all AOF members and friends, I would like to thank Lord King again for sharing his extraordinary perspective and wisdom on so many important topics. I would also like to thank our members and friends for joining us today. If you'd like to know more about our upcoming activities, please follow AOF LinkedIn by scanning the QR code on the screen. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>